And uh, we'll say a word of prayer before we get started here. Father, we just thank you for letting us be here to study your word. We thank you, Lord, that we can free together and learn about you. Father, protect those freedoms. I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We've been in the Feast of Booths for three and a half chapters. Okay? Now in verse 22, everything changes. Okay. We're going to see that it's winter time. They're at the Feast of Dedication. And they are again in Jerusalem. So verse 22. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter. Okay. So the Feast of Dedication, or maybe you've heard it called something different. Maybe you've heard it called Hanukkah. Right? You've heard them talk about it. Hanukkah, right? Usually takes place in December. This year it actually starts in the last of November and goes into the first part of December. And it's also the Feast of Dedication. So what does this mean? It's a, to give you a bit of history so you understand better what the Feast of Dedication is and what it was, what it represents, our Bible goes from the Old Testament to the New, right? We go from Malachi to Matthew. We go from the, from the Medo-Persian Empire to the New Testament and Rome being in power. They, Rome was a world ruler when Matthew starts. World power shifted from the east to the west, from the Orient to, to the Occident, from the Asia to Europe, from Medo-Persia to Greece. Over 400 years between Malachi and Matthew, and these are called the silent years because there was no word given during that 400 years. But God wasn't still, God was at work. A lot of things took place, things did happen during that 400 years. These uh, silent years, those in between years, there were others who had conquered Israel during that time. Okay, and the Syrians being one of them. Now the Syrians, they came in and conquered Jerusalem, took over Israel, and they took over the temple. They defiled the temple any way they could, including sacrificing pigs in the temple. Now, if you don't think about the Jews, the pigs are unclean, they have nothing to do with pigs. We got to go to Israel. I really wanted to order a ham and cheese omelet. No such thing in Israel. No ham, no pigs. Okay? So they were sacrificing pigs in the temple. And so along came the Maccabees. Now, the Maccabees got together. There have been different revolts at different times. The Maccabees got together and they did it right. And they overthrew the Syrians, okay? It was led by Judas Maccabus, which his name means the hammer. Here's the right name for this. His name means the hammer. So they go and they overthrow the Syrians and they kick them out, killed them while they could, kick the rest of them out, and they came in and started cleaning things up. And they cleaned the temple and the temple grounds. Okay? They cleaned them and then they cleansed them. And then they rededicated the temple. So this became known as Dedication Day, which became the Feast of Dedication, or as we are here called today, Hanukkah. Okay? Around 63 BC, Pompeii, the Roman, took Jerusalem, and the people of Israel passed under the uh, rulership of the new world power, which was Rome. They were under the Roman government at the time that Jesus was born, and the, throughout the period of the New Testament, Rome was in power. All right? So when I say things were happening in that 400 years, Rome was part of it. You think, well, how can that be if they were like rulers over the Israelites? Well, because of this, Rome, they built. 
and they built the finest roads in the world at that time. Okay? So when the gospel came along, and in the book of Acts, you see after Stephen was stoned, it says the gospel went out. It's those roads that helped carry the gospel to the known world. Also during that time, synagogues were built because people were taken in captive and taken off different places. They could not go to Jerusalem to worship at the temple, so they built synagogues, which are like churches, okay? And so God had those ready to go, so when the gospel went out, these Jews, these Hebrews that were saved could go to the synagogues and talk about Jesus. Things took place in that 400 years, right? Romans 5, 6, for while we, were, while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. What was the right time? Christ was not born until it was the right time for the world. The right roads to go, they had synagogues to go to, there was a system already in place. I mean, they could travel by sea, they could travel by road. At the right time, Christ came. At the right time, he died. Okay? At the right time. Now, behind the festival of dedication, there was this messianic emphasis. Alright? From the time that the temple was cleansed and rededicated, they focused on the Messiah. So there's this, this messianic overtone to the Feast of Dedication. And so you can see why they would ask Jesus what they ask him here in just a minute. Let's look at chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. And Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us, Plainly. They gather around Jesus. They tell him they want to know plainly. They want him to tell them boldly if he is the Messiah. Well, that's pretty nice to describe. Don't beat around the bush. Just tell us up front. You ever wanted to tell, to tell somebody that? You ever told somebody that? Stop beating around the bush. What do you want? It's a great thing for a husband to tell a wife. Let me tell you, ladies, hints don't work. You want something? Tell me right up front. Write me a note, you know? You want something for Christmas? Just tell me. I can guess all kinds of stuff. You get all kinds of stuff, you're going, well, this is okay. You know? Tell me plainly. Hey, Jesus, tell us boldly, are you the Messiah? Verses 25 through 30. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you did not believe. When did he tell them? When did he tell them, I am the Messiah? Okay, now, before I go any further, i gotta, I got to just bring this up because... This is a dangerous thing to say because there had been other people come along and these little uprisings come up and this person would be like, I am the Messiah. Yeah. And they'd be, they'd be squashed. Okay? So Jesus never said, I am the Messiah. Also, it can be kind of considered blasphemy. So he never just up front said, I am the Messiah. I am the Christ. Although he was. Okay? When did he tell them? When did he tell them? If he didn't tell them. You ever thought about that? When did he tell them if he didn't tell them? I told you. You did not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. He has told them of every miracle he did. He healed the lame. He healed the blind. He, he healed the sick. Right? You read the four Gospels, you see where he brought people back to life. Yeah. The works that I do in my Father's name 
bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not part of my flock. Now, here we go again with what he's talking about in the first part of chapter 10. Although some time has passed, he is still bringing up the thing about the shepherd and the flock. 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. Mm. Verse 29 and 30, he says something that just makes him mad all over. When he says this, they totally forgot what he was saying before. Okay? My Father who has given to me is greater, greater than all. No one's able to snatch my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Let me tell you, this was seen as blatant blasphemy. I and the Father are one. I can just see him going, ah! He probably passed out. He probably passed, passed out. Alright? You know, all too often we hear discussion related to eternal security. And we have the feeling that, you know, even if we spit in the face of God and God will say, oh, that's alright, that's okay. If we curse the Holy Spirit, we're going to just think, that's okay because we have eternal security. We can do whatever we want to do. We're okay. The perseverance of the saints is what's a noteworthy teaching of Christian theology. Okay? But the, we need to take the warnings of the Bible seriously. Okay? As to the assurance text, we don't need to presume the graciousness of the grace of God. Okay? Eternal life is a gift. It's a gift. It is not something we own apart from God. So how are we going to have eternal security in God if we turn from God? See what I'm saying here? We are absolutely dependent upon Jesus, our shepherd, for that gift. And it is binding that we live in the gratitude, we live in gratitude towards God. For this new life in Christ. We sometimes get the feeling that we, we can do whatever we wish if we're saved because of the grace of God. Keep your finger there in John. We'll go over to 1 Corinthians 10. First Corinthians 10, verse 6. Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumbled, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example as, as an example as an example that they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages have come. Therefore let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed, lest he fall. Paul wrote that. He just said, Christians, you know what? Be Christian. True Christians remain faithful. True Christians remain faithful. Why? Because they have been given by God to Jesus and ultimately to the world as witnesses of God in Christ. 
The persevering power of God is therefore working in their midst. Accordingly, the shepherd, the, uh, shepherd, shepherd, the, shepherd, the good shepherd, the great shepherd who is Jesus Christ, is there to protect the sheep from the enemy. But we must not invite the enemy in. We must live as true followers of Christ. When we say we're a believer, we say we're a Christian, but we're living like the world, we are tempting Christ. We're inviting Satan in. We're inviting evil in. Let's go on, verses 31 through 33. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. You ever get the feeling sometimes they're even wanting to kill him with rocks? Over and over they picked up stones to stone him, which was a viable way to kill somebody. You ever been hit with a rock? They hurt. But now, think about this. Usually when they stone somebody, they pick up stones. And they would start hitting you with these big stones. And when you went down, you were really done because then they went for the head. Okay? Romans, they, they, they took care of punishment. But stoning somebody could take care of them right now. So they picked up stones, again, to stone Jesus. They already had that in their head. They're going to stone him. Okay? Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? Don't you just love the way Jesus just handled people? Do you ever wish sometimes you could think as fast? You always think of something clever to say later, right? <clears throat> Jesus, he says, I've shown you many good works from the Father. Which of these good works are you going to stone me for? Which ones? The Jews answered him, it is not for the good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus, he turns the charge back on them. And then he challenges them to provide a rationale for the use of the word gods. I'm sorry. This is coming up. But Jesus right here, he turns the tables back, back on and says, what's the good works you're going to kill me for? Which, which, which ones? Which ones? All right, so verse 34 Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said you are gods. If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God? I, if I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. Jesus right now challenges them using their own word, the law. Right? The scripture of the day, they didn't have the New Testament, they were living it. So scripture was what we consider the Old Testament. So he is using the very scripture, which they say they believe and they teach and they go by. He's using this to say, okay, wait a minute. How are you going to do this? So he takes scripture and he, he, he brings up the use of the word gods in the law. And Jesus' logic was predictably clear. In their, in, in their source book, the law, it called humans gods, and the scriptures are utterly, utterly reliable. All right? They could not be broken. They were, they were set in stone. Then, what was their problem? And so Jesus brings this up. 
that they, they didn't like it. All right? Jesus' question raised with the Jews concerns who God's were according to Psalm 82. Jesus, by the way, loved the Psalms. If you read the four Gospels, he's quoting Psalms over and over if you study these things out. He's always bringing up Psalms, either by quote or just like this. He brings reference in Psalm 82, right? It's best to remember that Jesus, he raises this issue in a rhetorical fashion because he knew his opponents could not supply an answer. He knew they could not supply an answer to what he was saying. They had no idea how to answer him. They could not adequately defend their charge of blasphemy. Couldn't do it. The main point is that, that he was, in fact, God sent. He is the one that God sent to this earth. And scripture could apply any sort of theological terms to create beings. How much more should these terms apply to the unique Son of God? And I like that last verse. Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. How did he escape? Did he pull away and run off? No. If you read scripture, what happens, they're, they're, they're going to get a hold of him. They're going to do something. And all of a sudden, they don't have a hold of him. He just walks through them. He just walks through the crowd and walks away. And they're all going, yeah, get him, get him. And then finally go, where is him? Where'd he go? Where'd he go? Verse 40 through 42. He went away across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. And many came to him, and they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true. And many believed in him there. Verses 40 through 42, this represents the end of the public ministry of Jesus. This is the end of his public ministry. From here on, he turns his focus to his disciples and his death. What does this mean to us? What does this mean to you and me? They wanted Jesus to come right out and tell them if he was indeed the Messiah. If he was the Christ, come right out boldly and tell us. They couldn't read the signs. They couldn't see what was right in front of them. They wanted him to just say, okay, yep, that's me. There are those today who cannot plainly see that Jesus is the only hope. He is the only way. There is no other way to God but through Jesus. If there was, Jesus died in vain. There is no other way. The law could not bring you to salvation. It could point out all your sin. The law could point out all your wrongs, but it could not take your sin away. They would do their sacrifices and they would hope they had forgiveness. Everything they did, they hoped it worked. With Jesus, we know it does. With Jesus, we know when we ask forgiveness, we know beyond any shadow of a doubt. If we ask him sincerely from our heart, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. He does. He does. Make me a new creation. Wash me make me new. He does it. You know what's so awesome about Jesus? We can ask him to forgive us of our sin and come back five minutes later start confessing those same sin, forgive me of this, and Jesus will go, what are you talking about? Well, my sin. He said, I don't know what you're talking about. Why? Because when we ask him to forgive us, not only does he forgive, he forgets. The Bible says he takes our transgressions Throws them as far as the east is from the west. How far is that? That's forever. Why? Because the east is always east. 
West is always west. North becomes south, and south becomes north. But east is always east. The Bible says he takes our transgressions and he throws them into the sea of forgetfulness and remembers them no more. Wow, that's good news for me. I don't know about you. There are people today that cannot see that Jesus is the answer. They're waiting for this big, booming voice to come out and say, Hey, I'm your only hope. Turn to me. But God doesn't work that way, does he? It's that still, small voice. It's that still, small voice. He is that nagging thought that you really can't do this on your own. That being a good old boy isn't good enough. But there really is more. Hebrews 2, 3 says, How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Well, the fact is, and the answer is, we can't and we won't. Hebrews 9, 27 says, Just as man is destined to die once after that to face judgment, I don't know about you, but I've come face to face with death more than once. I had the doctor tell my wife and me more than once, you came real close to cashing your chips. You came real close to me dead. Second Corinthians 6, 2 says, I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. C.S. Lewis said, We are all too easily satisfied about ourselves. Matt, Chan Matt, oh, Matt Chandler said, To hide our sin is to run from our healing and sanctification. Confession is running towards it. He already knows. I want to ask you this morning are you running? Are you running? You see, it is possible for someone who has been saved to still run from God, from what He wants us to do, from the calling He has for us, from getting closer to Him. It is possible for this just to take place. It's also possible for those who have never asked Jesus into their heart to keep saying, not today. Not today. Not right now. Not right now. Later. Later. I've done funerals for people who said later and didn't get that chance. Where are we at today? Where are we as individuals? Where are we as a church? Are we stepping out, stepping up? Are we going forward for God? Or are we just doing our own thing? You see, an unsaved person doing their own thing takes you to hell. A church doing their own thing is just playing church. If we're not being that church that steps up and steps out, we're not being the church. Because we're given a command, go into all the world, preach the gospel. Go into all the world, make disciples. And that begins next door begins with family and friends. Yeah, sometimes they're the hardest ones. Sometimes it's easier to go to Africa and tell people about Jesus. I know. I've done it. Where do you stand today? Where do you stand as individuals? Where do we stand as a church? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Holy 